This afternoon, we extend our warmest welcome to our families, our faculty, our friends, and especially to our seniors, whom we are honoring today with University School's highest award, our diploma. We come together this afternoon to celebrate the highlight of our academic year, the graduation of our senior class, and to gather with our seniors and their families one last time. Seniors, this afternoon you are crossing from high school to your new life. There are no guards at the border, no passports or visas required. As you walk across the stage and receive your diploma, you are entering another world. You are crossing our stage to enter a new stage, one of the many stages that play a literal and metaphorical role in our lives. This fall, we all encountered Theodore Roosevelt on our school stage when Sam Levitich took the role in our upper school production of Arsenic and Old Lace. You may recall Sam's comical, slightly loony, interpretation as he brought Teddy Roosevelt to life, yelling bully, blowing on his bugle, and calling out charge as he stormed up the staircase of the Brewster home. My association with Teddy Roosevelt goes back much further than that wonderful play. When I was in fourth grade, I won the school prize for top honors, and I was awarded Theodore Roosevelt's biography a book I still treasure in our family bookcase. The address of our home was 101 Roosevelt Drive. I grew up in the shadow of Roosevelt's summer home, Sagamore Hill, Oyster Bay, New York. And so we paid special attention to Roosevelt in history class. Each year, we would take a field trip to this big Victorian home facing the Long Island Sound a house decorated with heavy wooden staircases and stuffed elk heads looming out of the dark corners. We learned about Roosevelt's long and successful political career and about the courage he carried forth since childhood. We learned about Roosevelt's achievements as a naturalist, explorer, hunter, author, and soldier. All as much a part of his fame as his being sworn in as President of the United States at 42, making him the youngest president ever. Roosevelt was also the first of only three sitting presidents to have won the Nobel Peace Prize. He was an inspired and inspiring figure. He inspired me. And so my story comes full circle, as it turns out that Sagamore Hill is not so far from Ferry Chasm Road. As I walked across the stage all those years ago to receive my book, I could never have imagined standing on this stage talking about what it came to symbolize in my life, scholarship and courage. During your assembly tribute to me last week, I sat on our theater stage in the chair that Roosevelt used when he spoke in Milwaukee in 1912. Miss Amy Langenecker brought it here from the Florentine Opera for that special occasion. Then, as now, I look at our seniors and remind you of Roosevelt's words that have meant so much to me. Far and away, the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. And that is my message to you as I leave my most important good work as your teacher and your principal. Seniors, since entering upper school, you have accumulated knowledge, experience, friends, and even wisdom. Now, together and surrounded by families, classmates, and teachers, you stand proud and ready for your new life. Make that life important and make it good. Remember what you learned about the real value of the American dream in English class. Happiness is found in demanding your best self and doing good work. Building and keeping good relationships with your family, your friends, and the people you work with. 
like Teddy Roosevelt, look forward with courage and curiosity. And so as we begin this splendid celebration, I invoke the divine spirit that animates us all to watch over you as we send you off to make new lives for yourselves, lives full of choices and lives full of joy. I welcome each one of you to this celebration of who you are and who you will become. Welcome, welcome to graduation. grandparents, friends, and students. On behalf of the faculty and the Board of Trustees, I am delighted to join Mrs. Lyons in welcoming you to what is a joyful commencement celebration. Before we begin celebrating our guests and our guests of honor, the students, please allow me a moment to introduce some special guests who have joined me on the graduation stage. The president of our Board of Trustees, Mr. Mike Roth, Today's graduation speaker and esteemed graduate of the class of 1997, Dr. Raj Chetty. Once again, our upper school head, Mrs. Roseanne Lyons. The upper school, the head of the upper school, assistant head of the upper school, I'm sorry, Mr. Timothy Quinn. And the assistant head of school, Mr. Greg Bach. I also would like you to welcome our lower school head, Dr. Carolyn Lang, and our middle school head, Mrs. Pam Nosbush. Would you please also join me in welcoming other members of our Board of Trustees? Ms. Deanna Dorr, Mr. John Hopkins, Mrs. Karen Huffman, Sangeeta Khanna, Mrs. Laura Leverett, Mr. Andrew Pressel, Mr. Mrs. Ann Ranke, Mr. Mike Roos, Ms. Marina Rosenberg, Ms. Gillian Stewart, and Mr. Buddy Tucker. I also ask you that you join me in thanking the people who have labored tirelessly behind the scenes to prepare for what is really a splendid graduation day. These are our hardworking staff, members who put literally countless hours into organizing graduation, into preparing grounds, buildings, the setup for rehearsals, the almost 600 chairs that are placed before us. Mrs. Nancy Yeager, Mrs. Dawn Taylor, the University School grounds, maintenance, security, and housekeeping and food service crews, please join me in offering them a round of applause. <laughs> Today we honor a very special retiree, our upper school head, Mrs. Roseanne, Rosie Lyons. Mrs. Lyons has been at the helm of the upper school for the past 20 years. She began her tenure at university school as an English teacher in the fall of 1985. Mrs. Lyons was appointed chair of the English department the very next year, and seven short years later, head of the upper school. Under her tutelage, our upper school has grown in countless ways. Mrs. Lyons initiated the house system, freshman and senior retreats, a four-year advising system, senior speeches, and the Global Scholars Program. Mrs. Lyons has also guided university school in becoming one of the finest academic institutions in this country. And at this time, I would like to call Mr. Mike Roth to the, up to the podium to present Mrs. Lyons with a special commemoration of honor for her dedication to university school. Well, thank you, uh, and good afternoon. Uh, it's my privilege to be here on behalf of the Board of Trustees, as well as the USM community. And uh, I'm going to exercise some executive privilege and say a few words about Mrs. Lyons. Um, Mrs. Lyons has been going through a serial uh, exercise in commemorations, um, and they're all well-deserved. But this is not easy for her, if you understand uh, who she is and what she's about. Mrs. Lyons is a very humble person, She's a very serious person and a very organized person. And this is really messing with her schedule. <laughs> it hasn't helped that she's been through more retirement events than Brett Favre. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But this one's okay, Mrs. Lyons, because uh, this is uh, from the Board of Trustees, and we're allowed to bend the curve a little bit now and then. Now, it's, it's typical in these kinds of exercises to uh, extol the individual, to recount their accomplishments, et cetera. But by now, I think that's been done. So I'm just going to stipulate that Mrs. Lyons has been fantastic, that she's a teacher's teacher, that she's been a, a terrific uh, and innovative leader uh, and uh, mentor and colleague, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And I, I don't really want to talk about Mrs. Lyons. I want to talk about that other person. I want to talk about Rosie. See, Rosie doesn't get to come out and play all that, that often. And it's, it's, it's the nature of the role that Mrs. Lyons uh, fills. Uh, when you're a teacher, that's enough by itself. But when you're also the leader of the upper school, uh, and you have that awesome responsibility to take boys and girls and to turn them into the young men and women I see in front of me, that's, that's serious business. It's serious business because at the end, when you come out of here, uh, you have been educated, you have character, and hopefully you're getting in the mail a fat envelope and not a thin envelope from the institution of your choice. And that, that's a big responsibility. And Mrs. Lyons takes that responsibility quite seriously. So there's not a lot of opportunity for Rosie to really come out. However, on occasion, Rosie does come out. And my favorite recollection of that was actually in this room, in this gymnasium. It was the pep rally for homecoming in 2007. And right where you're sitting now, the football team was dancing, which in and of itself is a sight you don't easily forget. <laughs> and the place was rocking. And the, the, the football players were dancing. And suddenly, in the middle of their dancing, they ran over to this side of the gymnasium. And if you've ever been to a football game, you know, uh, after the introduction, uh, they're, all, they're all jumping around. And they're, they're huddled around their leader. They're huddled around the quarterback. And, and it's a wild scene. And, and they were doing that. And then on cue, with the music going, they bowed down. And in the middle was a diminutive, diminutive figure, Rosie. And she was dancing. <laughs> Not just any dancing. This is like funky monkey dancing, right? <laughs> The hips were going, the arms were going, and that was the Rosie I'll always remember. So as much as we will always have in our minds a recollection of Mrs. Lyons, and we will miss her tremendously, because through this ceremony, under her watch, probably around 2,000 students have passed through here. And that in and of itself is probably the best thing you can ever say to an educator. But in our hearts, we will miss Rosie. So, Class of 2013, I turn to you. This is your day. It is your culminating celebration. Many of you have been at university school almost your entire lives, some since middle school, and while still others of you have joined us in the upper school. But well, regardless of your entry date, you have been a part of us, and I dare say, we a part of you in more ways that are more significant than I think any of you may even realize today. In fact, what I want you to know is that no matter where you go or what you do, where you wind up or who you're with, you are a part of us forever. And in just a few minutes, you will be alumni of University School of Milwaukee. As you reflect back on your days and the months and the years at university school, the memories will undoubtedly change and they'll morph as the years pass. Next year, I believe you will almost most clearly remember your friends. You will remember your friends as they sit around you today. You will miss each other and clearly you will remember their voices, you'll remember the laughter, 
and you'll remember all of the places you used to walk together and talk together and hang out together. You'll remember that theater lobby. But then inevitably the years will drift by. You will meet new friends. You'll probably fall in love and then out of love and back in love again. You'll study all sorts of different things. You'll find different passions. You'll create different lives apart from each other, apart in geography, apart in lifestyle, and apart in substance. And the memories will fade as they are replaced with these new events and these new situations. But today, I suggest to you to be very thoughtful about this. Be careful of not allowing the friendships from your childhood and adolescence to fade away. Because the older you get, the more you may find that you need people who knew you when you were young. Hold on to your friends who sit around you today. They are truly a part of you. And you will treasure it if you know them when you are older. I found myself in the last 10 years doing a curious thing. I keep thinking things as I'm observing people, things I never did in my youth. I find myself giving them unsolicited mental advice. Luckily, I usually do it only to myself. For instance, I'll be looking at some young person slouching over and I'll think, sit up straight, you're going to have spinal curvature. Or I'll look at a haggard young mother in a shopping mall and I'll, th and I'll think, just enjoy them while they're young, mom, because before you know, you're going to be waiting for them to call you. And I realize this probably means that I've reached a pretty dangerous point in my life. This is a phase where I like to take advantage of a situation, any situation where I can give out a little bit of advice. I think it probably stems from hoping that the others won't, will avoid the mistakes that I've made in life. But it certainly puts me in an age category, don't you think, seniors? And unfortunately for you here today, it kind of intensifies when I have a microphone. So this is my opportunity. I'm hoping that you'll be patient with me while I impart just a little bit of wisdom that I hope you'll take forward with you. So I was thinking that instead of reflecting back on your years at university school, as I mentioned, I think we should look forward. And as I mentioned earlier, this will be the last day that you will sit together with such commonality. Going forward, your paths will diverge. You'll go off to different colleges and universities with different locations, cultures, and you'll all achieve different results. You will learn and grow apart under varying circumstances and in dissimilar environments. And as you all know, in biology, that means speciation. But for humans, it means independence. Oh, don't be mistaken. Those of us who will stay behind in your wake, your teachers, your parents, your family, we will find solace in telling ourselves that you're taking our lessons with you. But the reality is, you will create your own futures and do so while being influenced in different worlds. And I don't think it's a leap of reality to say that most of you are pretty darn motivated young adults. You absolutely would not be sitting here as almost graduates of university school if that weren't true. And over the years, I've observed a lot of graduates from a lot of very good schools all motivated young adults like you. And there seems to be a bit of a common thread or a common theme that emerges. Most of them have a plan. And for some, it's simply which college they'll go to and which degree they'll pursue. But for some, it's much more complicated than that in detail. For some, it goes on to graduate school, beyond graduate school, and on and on and on. And I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. In fact, I think it's really pretty, a pretty good thing, and it tends to keep us focused. However, I want to suggest something to you today. I want to suggest today that if your life plan, your personal flow chart, or your timeline is just a little bit hazy, don't worry about it. Some of the most interesting people I know did not know at age 18 what they wanted to do with their lives. In fact, I think some of the most interesting 45-year-olds I know aren't too sure yet what they want to ultimately do with their lives. So the point is, regardless of how much you plan, and how much you prepare for the future, there is one inalienable truth. You will be forced at some point to diverge from your plan. And it's important to be mentally and emotionally prepared to do so. Don't let it rock you when it happens. Too many people do. Instead, I suggest to you that you lean in. Go with the change. Recognize that the only sure thing about change is that it will change. Life is about recognizing when you need to alter your life plan. Make room for a new person, a new event, a new idea, something that you haven't seen. 
I like to think about this as seeing around the corners instead of having some myopic focus on some self-imposed plan. So many of us do that. We have ourselves on this sort of trajectory of ideas and we create a vision and we really invest ourselves in that vision. And sometimes I believe that we even focus so hard on that end goal that we go through life wearing a bit of a metaphoric blinder. We miss what's lurking around the corners. We either sail right by something that's very important or more dangerously, we may not look at the future with a broader lens. And by this I mean that you get so invested in that life plan that you might miss the opportunity to explore other possibilities. So when I reflect back on my life and I think about personally and professionally when I was the most stressed and when I was struggling the most, it was because I hadn't seen around the corners. I've also observed that there are some very successful people who do just that. They refuse to leap or be rushed into decisions, into plans or actions. They are thoughtful and they are contemplative. These successful people know there are lots of twists and turns to every plan. There are unforeseen and yet sometimes predictable consequences and if you just slow down and think, if we just take the time to peer into the future and imagine what might be hiding around the corners, from my experience I think most of us might just miss this thoughtfulness because we're just plain too hurried. We have a life plan and a vision and we're usually pretty motivated to get started with it. And I'll even take that a step further. I think this happens really frequently with smart people just like you. And I dare say, as you sit before us today, you're probably pretty invested and very motivated in your next phase of your life plan. And again, just be thoughtful about that. The race is long and sometimes you're ahead, but sometimes you might just find yourself behind. But in the end, the race is only with yourself. In the end, you're not really going to care so much where you got your degree from. You're not going to think about the different choices you've made in your careers, how successful you are, how much money you made. In the end, the only life you're really going to be comparing yours to is your own. When you're reflecting back, you're going to be thinking about what you did, what you learned, what you achieved, what you provided to those around you, and in the end, because I know you're good people and I know you come from good families, most likely what you're really going to want to know is that you made a positive difference. So class of 2013, this is your launching time. This is the time when you will diverge, you will create your own personal and professional legacy. It is your time of individualization. The next four years will bring another way of learning, another culture, and for many of you, another regional experience. There will be people who will influence events that will shape and experiences to be had that you can't even imagine as you sit here at the end of your university school career. So class of 2013, lean in, look around the corners, expect the unexpected, and life will be wonderfully rich and interesting. We wish you Godspeed. One of the many strengths of our school is its long history, dating back to its earliest predecessor school in 1851. And along with this extensive history comes a long line of students who, just like you, proudly walked across this stage upon graduation. And then they proceeded on to become integral members of the school community and as alumni. Members of the class of 2013, as I said, you will soon be alumni of this school, and we hope you will assume that role with great pride. In 1984, the USM Alumni Association introduced the Alumni Service Award to recognize university school or predecessor school graduates for their service. Since then, 32 alumni have been recognized based on the criteria of this esteemed award, which reads as follows. The Alumni Service Award is given to an alumnus or an alumna by the University School of Alumni Board of Directors in grateful recognition of achievements in working toward the betterment of University School of Milwaukee and to the community in which it serves. And today, on behalf of the USM Alumni Association, we are so pleased to introduce our 33rd honoree, Mr. Fred Galfus, class of 1971. And I'd like to call Mr. Galfus. Fred 
was a lifer at USM, having started his education at Milwaukee Country Day School in first grade. Fred served as a prefect his senior year and upon graduation matriculated at Williams College. He holds a master's degree from the University of Wisconsin School of Economics and a Juris Doctor from the University of Wisconsin Law School. Fred is a partner in the Milwaukee Office of Foley and Lardner and has been recognized by inclusion in the best lawyers in America in the area of health care law. When Fred returned to Milwaukee in the early 1980s to begin his career in law, it wasn't long before he reconnected with USM as an active alumnus and eventually as a school parent. During his many years of volunteer service to USM, Fred served in numerous roles, including class agent, reunion chair, annual giving volunteer, annual giving co-chair, member of the Board of Trustees from 2002 until 2012, and as the president of the Board of Trustees from 2004 to 2007. He's currently serving as a member of the Endowment Board, a member of the Strategic Planning Committee, and as co-chair of this year's Senior Parent Gift. Fred continues to, to participate in the school's leadership. In addition to the contributions through his volunteer and leadership positions, Fred and his wife, Ann Hamilton, are also members of USM's Leadership Society, honored for their role as generous benefactors of the school. The Giles family has been connected to USM for generations. Alumni include Fred's mother and father who had graduated in the 1930s from Downer Seminary and from Country Day, and many aunts and uncles and cousins, as well as his two siblings. Fred and Ann's three children are also alumni, Alice Galfus Havens, class of 2004, Robert C.C., class of 2007, and following this ceremony, John will join the community as a member of the class of 2013. In total, Fred's dedication and accomplishments have distinguished him as more than just a dear friend to his beloved alma mater. It is with extreme pleasure that I present the 2013 Alumni Service Award to Fred Galfus with sincere appreciation for his many, many years of service to the school. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, it is really a joy to be a part of a ceremony honoring the class of 2013. As uh, Laura indicated, my son John is a member of the class. Way to go, John. <laughs> I told him I'd embarrass him. Uh, but through John, I've, got, I've gotten to know a wide swath of the class of 2013. And I have, it, it's a special class. Um, it's one that's going to make university school very, very proud for 50 or 60 years. You know, I actually first walked into Country Day School when I was three years old. It was before first grade. Um, so I really have no memory of life before Country Day or university school. The school has enriched me as a student, as an alum, as a volunteer, and on days like today as a parent. I know I'll, I'll stay involved with the university school until I can no longer do anything, including going to hockey games, uh, boys and girls ice hockey, which uh, sustained me over the long winters in, in Milwaukee. But it's really a, an institution for which I have immense respect, and I am truly touched to be honored today. Thank you very much. I'm sure you heard that Mrs. Fuller is losing her voice, and so I am filling in. I am going to serve as the introducer to our valedictorian and to our keynote speaker. When asked to describe Kern Khanna, his teachers consistently use one word, brilliant. Whether he is researching how to increase the efficiency of petrophilic bacteria for the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, or offering nuanced articles uh, supporting Roger Chillingworth's quest for revenge in the Scarlet Letter, Kern's mind is always working. Focused and naturally inquisitive, Kern completed 10 advanced placement and six honors classes during his tenure in upper school. 
Talented in both the humanities and sciences, Kern's junior English teacher shared that in her class, Kern never rested on his natural abilities. Rather, he raised his own bar each day in order to grow as an intellectual. Similarly, Kern's AP computer science teacher noted that Kern is a born scientist and has an incessant laser-like focus that continues to drill down until the ultimate truth is discovered. Kern has served as a role model and an inspiration to his peers and teachers alike, and he will undoubtedly bring his many talents to the classroom at Stanford University this fall. It is with great pleasure that I introduce you to the valedictorian of the class of 2013, Kern Kana. avid sports fan. For years, I loved to watch highlight reel after highlight reel and to be amazed by the legendary basketball player Michael Jordan. In every game I watched, even when he was sick or injured, Jordan never failed to put forward his best effort. He always made the clutch play at the end of the game, and I always wondered what made him better than the rest of the professional ball players around him. The answer lies in a remark spoken by Michael Jordan himself. He said, I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I have been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Experts have wondered, what makes Michael Jordan so good? The answer is simple he experienced failure. At the beginning of my freshman year, I would have disagreed if you told me that failure was important. I always aimed for success and naively shared the opinion that failure was disappointing and even detrimental. But through my daily classes at USM, I quickly learned that dealing with failure is an inevitable part of high school. After reading Margaret Edson's play, Wit, in English class this year, I actually understood the benefits of failure. This play recounts the dying hours of cancer victim and English professor Vivian Baring as she realizes the flaws in her strict and rigorous teaching style. Her doctor's impersonal and emotionless nature shocked her and accurately reflected her own interaction with her students. This hospital experience allows Baring to understand the value of deep, and kind connections that intellect alone cannot provide. Even though an accomplished 50-year-old poetry professor has a very different life from a high school senior, we can all understand the lessons provided in Edson's work and realize that no one is too advanced in his or her life to learn from a mistake and to experience failure. The famous scientist Albert Einstein characterized the situation of cancer victim Vivian Baring perfectly when he said, once a genius falls into a seductive mistake, he is liable to become fixated on one idea. He is then blind to the mistake, and if this blindness is compounded by stubbornness, he will be deaf to criticism and he will cling to his mistake forever. Just as Einstein points out, Vivian Baring never understands her own arrogance and her indifference to the students until her imminent death. Failure plays an integral role in our lives almost every day, whether it occurs on the sports court or in the classroom. I recall an example of failure in an advanced placement biology lab this year when our class was conducting the long-awaited dissection of a fetal pig. As I soon entered the class, the teacher gave us a sheet diagramming anatomical parts and then motioned for us to begin dissecting the pigs lying on the counter. I had no idea what I was doing, and my group mates sardonically encouraged me by saying that touching the pig meat and sticking my fingers inside his guts would remedy the problem. <laughs> I was lost. I did not know what to do, so I started randomly slicing up the pig. As a, as a result of my abominable surgical skills, 
I soon realized that I had partially cut out the large intestine and the gallbladder. <laughs> Instead of cleanly identifying the parts of the pig, I had butchered it into an amalgam of pork bits smeared in viscous purple blood. <laughs> it was safe to say that my experiment did not go the way I planned. But simply recognizing my failure was not the only step that I took in this lab. The memorable John C. Calhoun once said, one must learn from his mistakes and build on his successes. I followed this lesson and not only learned how to dissect a pig, but more importantly, I also learned to harness my setbacks. In fact, my group members and I were assigned to complete a more thorough dissection of the pig the next cycle. We were able to complete this task efficiently because we learned from our mistakes and assumed a more positive attitude. As many of you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I concentrated on a different methodology and was subs subsequently able to complete this activity. The free market capitalistic society values competition and success, and it is easy to become frustrated when one does not reach his goal. In the eyes of many, life is composed of a set of goals that must be reached in order to move forward. This mathematical thinking of causation may hold true for some, but this lesson cannot be further from the truth in my eyes. The goal of high school should not be to simply enroll in a prestigious college, and the goal of college should not be to simply achieve a job with high income. In these periods of our youth, instead of, instead of living so cautiously, we should not be afraid to fail. My experiences at the University School of Milwaukee have taught me that failure is an inescapable and necessary part of our lives. Before I finish, I would like to pay tribute to the teachers for their incredible contribution to our academic and personal growth. In their pursuit to educate us and teach us important lessons, they become a foundation of our next generation of scholars, innovators, and leaders. I would also, also like to thank the parents and family members in this audience for supporting us as we have experienced success and failure. Our connections with our family are instrumental to shaping who we have become today. Now, to my fellow graduates, consider the talent we have in this room right now. I'm certain that the members of the great class of 2013 will have bright careers and successful lives. Among the 76 of us, we have accumulated state championships, academic honors, and other accolades in theater and clubs. But as we depart USM and move into a larger world, we should expect to face challenging obstacles and roadblocks that will hinder us on our ultimate path to success. So let us now make an agreement to view failure as a necessary building block towards reaching our goals and accomplishing something great for our world. As the legendary basketball player Michael Jordan once said, if you run into a wall, don't turn around and give up. Figure out how to climb it, go through it, or work around it to ultimately reach your destination. Thank you.
to welcome our alumni back to campus and to learn more about the successes they are enjoying in their professional careers. To know that our graduates are having such a profound impact in society is a reward for our entire school community. That feeling is echoed exponentially for the alum who will deliver this year's commencement address. Dr. Raj Chetty has received more accolades that can be shared in this introduction and has been named as one of the top economists in the world by the New York Times and The Economist magazine. Dr. Chetty was recently awarded a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, often referred to as a genius grant. And he became one of the youngest recipients of the John Bates Clark Medal, awarded to the best American economist under the age of 40. A professor in the economics department at Harvard University, Dr. Chetty, also serves as the co-director of the Public Economics Group at the National Bureau of Economic Research, as well as editor of the Journal of Public Economics. Dr. Chetty's work has focused largely on applying economic rigor to three areas of public policy, retirement savings, equality of opportunity, and education. His education research, cited by President Barack Obama in last year's State of the Union Address, has focused on the impact of teachers, especially in the earliest years of a child's education as it relates to college graduation, earning potential, and other outcome success markers in adulthood. 
Dr. Chetty stood on this very stage only 16 years ago and addressed his fellow graduates and their guests as valedictorian of the class of 1997. We welcome him back today as an accomplished alumnus of university school. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest, Dr. Raj Chetty. Parents, teachers, and graduates, it's an honor to be able to speak to you all today, and especially to come back to USM to give this speech. This speech is especially meaningful to me because USM has contributed greatly to my life, uh, and over the past few years, I've been studying how we can make all children succeed to the best of their abilities, and I've had an opportunity to re reflect on the many ways in which USM has impacted my own life. I was just talking to the teachers on the way in, about how I was on the wait list to get into the school when we moved here in ninth grade. I'm very happy that I did, so thank you to whoever decided to take me off the wait list. Um, so uh, I think an occasion like this is a time to celebrate, but also one to look back and take stock of how we've gotten here and to think about what we can learn for the future. There are many lessons to be learned, but the one that I'm gonna focus on today is having a social impact and how our graduates these talented students here today can have a social impact in their own lives. So in the spirit of taking stock, let me start by taking you all the way back to your kindergarten class. So for the students here, you all thought that you were done with your last exam, but I have one last test question for you, which is from a kindergarten test. Okay, and so this is how the kindergarten test goes. I'll say a word to you, listen for the ending sound. You circle the picture that starts with the same sound. So I say cup, and because you all went to USM, you know that the answer is pencil and not duck. So what we did in our uh, research team is asked, how did the child who said duck instead of pencil, how is he doing 25 years later when we track these kids and look at outcomes like their earnings and various other things? So this is a graph showing you a plot of earnings between the ages of 25 and 27 versus your kindergarten test score on tests like what I just showed you. So the kid who said duck, unfortunately, is on the far left here, and the child who got many of those questions right is towards the right side of that graph. Now, this data is from a disadvantaged population in Tennessee, so the earnings levels are relatively low relative to what you might expect, but what I want you to see is that if you go from the bottom of your kindergarten class to the top of your kindergarten class, you have more than two and a half factor, or almost a tripling of earnings going from the bottom to the top at this very early age. Now, kindergarten test scores also predict many other things. For instance, if you were at the bottom of your kindergarten class, you have less than a 20% chance of going to college. If you were at the top of your kindergarten class, more than an 80% chance of going to college. Kindergarten test scores even predict how likely you are to be married. So, for, you know, I hope those of you, uh, you studied hard in kindergarten and, and did well. <laughs> so, uh, so the question that I want to focus on is what is driving this relationship between very early childhood performance and outcomes 20, 25 years later? And I want to address the three groups who are here, the parents, the teachers, and the students, and talk about how all of that relates to having a social impact. So let me start uh, with the parents. So I think, um, like many of us, uh, your intuition would be that parents are extremely important for kids' outcomes, and those kids who are doing well in kindergarten come from families that have contributed a great deal to their success both at that stage and later in life. Now, I think that that intuition is absolutely right. I think parents play a central role. As a social scientist, we want to try to document that and figure out what makes good parents. Now, that's a very difficult thing to do because if you think about how you'd establish that parents have a causal effect, you'd need to change a child's parents, right? So I'm sure many of you like, would like to hang on to your kids but really, if, you know, from a scientific perspective, what we'd like to do is take your child and assign that child to a different parent so that we can see what happens. Now, I'm sure you don't want to be involved in such an experiment. 
So the question is, how do you learn about the effect of parents, right? So a very creative study which illustrates what's being done in social science um, to help us learn about these uh, important issues was done by an economist named Bruce Sacerdote at Dartmouth where he had the idea of looking at kids who were adopted. And it turns out that adopted kids, there's often some randomness in the process such that some children may end up with certain families and other children may end up with other families just due to the nature of the way the adoption works. And so what he did is compare these children who were essentially identical Korean adoptees, some of whom were assigned, were very lucky to be assigned to well-educated parents who were professional uh, families like many of the parents here, and others who were less lucky and were assigned to parents who were not as well-educated from less affluent backgrounds and so forth. And what he found when he looked at those children 20 years later is that there were vast differences in their, uh, in their outcomes. So the kids who were lucky enough to be assigned to educated families, especially families with educated moms, uh, turned out to be much more likely to go to college, they were much healthier, they were earning more, they were doing better on many, many uh, metrics of success that we often uh, think about. So why is it that parents have such a big effect? I think one piece of insight comes from uh, this study here, which I, I find very fascinating, conducted by social psychologists at the University of Kansas. And so what uh, these people, Hart and Risley, did is track, so they, they um, taped uh, the conversations in households, taped one hour every day for two and a half years to see what professional families were doing differently from working class families or families on welfare. And what they noticed was that there's a dramatic difference and the amount of attention that parents are paying to their kids. So the outcome of the study is what's called the 30 million word gap by age four. The idea is that children from professional families are hearing so many more words per hour, triple the number as children from families on welfare, that by the time they're at age four, they've heard 30 million more words more. And so that's the kind of thing that drives those vast differences in kindergarten outcomes that I was showing you that later translate into big differences in outcomes in adulthood. So I want to say that you know, all of this statistical evidence very much resonates with me personally. One of the great gratifying things about the research I've been doing is seeing how it relates to my own experience here at USM and with my family. I'm very proud that my parents are here uh, today to, to, to be able to hear the speech as they were at my uh, graduation in 1997. And I attribute a lot of my own success to my parents. I, I see that in my own family. Um, my mother was the first person to become a doctor uh, in our community, the first woman to become a doctor in our community in South India. My dad came from a village of tremendous poverty to become a professor at Columbia. Uh, so they've achieved a vast amount in their lives, and I know that I wouldn't be here today uh, w without their impacts. And I think the same goes for many of the other students here today. I think you should be very grateful for your parents for getting you this far. They're going to contribute a, a lot more to your successes. Uh, and I'd like to congratulate the parents for achieving such wonderful outcomes for your children. Now, from a policy point of view, as someone who wants to try to improve outcomes in America, I think it's very important to understand the influence of parents, but it's hard to do a lot on the parent dimension in terms of policy. Because after all, as I was saying, we can't change kids' parents. We, uh, you know, people want to keep uh, their kids. It's very hard to, to uh, change things in the household. And so that naturally leads to a second focus, the second group that I want to talk about, which is teachers. And this is where I myself have been doing a lot of work and where I think one can have a tremendous social impact. So uh, again, with teachers, the challenge is in understanding how we can quantify the impact of teachers and how we can find the best teachers to teach our kids. Many of us have the intuition that we're indebted to our teachers, that they've influenced us in great ways, but it's been very difficult for social scientists to figure out precisely how to find and measure uh, teacher quality. So in our work, what we've been doing, which illustrates the, the frontier of social science research, uh, is to use what I basically call applying big data to public policy questions. So a lot of you hear about big data things like the tr tremendous amount of data that Google has, that Amazon has, that they use for marketing, for business purposes. My vision is to take that same type of big data and apply it to important social and public policy questions. So in this particular case, what we do is take school district records for two and a half million kids in a big city in the US, uh, 
and uh, that, that database uh, over a 20 year span gives you information on 18 million tests that these children have written. So it's a massive data set, which we then link to United States federal income tax returns, which allows you to track these children over a 25 year period. So basically I can ask, how did a person who had uh, teacher A instead of teacher B when they were in third grade, how are they doing uh, when they're 30 years old, which is gonna really allow us to get insight into the quantitative impacts of teachers. Now again, the problem in studying education is that you can't run an experiment. Nobody's gonna to wanna to be involved in an experiment where some children get assigned to a teacher who's known to be outstanding and other children get assigned to teachers who are known not to be as good. So how are you gonna get around that problem? So let me give you an example of how we figure out the impacts of teachers in our own study. So I'm gonna take an example here uh, where I, I have uh, John Stevens, a teacher who had a big impact on, on my own life, who I'm very happy is here today. Uh, and the hypothetical example that I want you to think about, which illustrates what we do in the data, is suppose you've got a set of students who get to 11th grade in USM in different years. And suppose it so happens that in 1996, Mr. Stevens, who's this outstanding teacher, shows up. They hire Mr. Stevens and he comes and teaches US history in 11th grade. So what I want to do is track how test scores evolve around the entry of this excellent teacher. So you can see before the teacher arrives, and now this is based on real data where we have thousands of cases that look like this in, uh, in the school district. Uh, you can see that the test scores don't, they're pretty flat right before the teacher arrives. And then right when this top 5% outstanding teacher arrives, test scores, one measure of academic achievement that we can see concretely in the data, immediately jump and they stay higher for um, you know, going forward as that teacher continues to teach more and more kids. Now, all of you know from your science experiments that you always wanna have a treatment group but also a control group to make sure your conclusions are actually right, so a very natural way to think about this problem is to look at test scores in the previous grade, in 10th grade. Mr. Stevens, by assumption, is not teaching in 10th grade. His entry to the school should have no impact on performance in 10th grade, right? And that's exactly, in fact, what you see in the data. Now, you can also look at the converse case, where you have this unfortunate teacher who doesn't really want to be there, uh, and he's a low-value added teacher in the bottom 5% uh, rating of quality, and when this teacher enters, he unfortunately pulls down kids' outcomes immediately. So this is totally symmetric. We see these big impacts of teachers on uh, students' uh, test score and academic outcomes. Now again, for me, it's been very interesting to work on this because it relates very much to my own experience at USM. I mentioned JS, a teacher who had a big impact on my way of thinking. In school, I spent a lot of time doing uh, science, I thought I would go into biomedical science, and one of the things that really left an impression on me is uh, all the social policy issues that JS would bring up in his class, and I remember at one point him saying, you know, someday uh, Raj is gonna be chairman of the Federal Reserve, and we're gonna talk about, you know, these issues are gonna be useful in his thinking, and I remember thinking, you know, I'm definitely gonna do science, there's no way I'm gonna do something like economics, but, you know, JS apparently was a much better predictor of future outcomes than me at, at that age. <laughs> Uh, I also remember many other teachers who are here. Um, Mr. Pack, uh, my, my science teacher, who spent a lot of time on uh, science projects with me. We went to many science fairs together. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was uh, the, the amount of dedication that he put in uh, to one particular student's science projects was, you know, just transformational for a student to get uh, that much attention. I also uh, am very grateful to, to teachers in numerous other subjects. You know, one other anecdote that comes to mind is Fred Lang, who's a math teacher, still teaching here uh, in the school today. And what always struck me about Mr. Lang is uh, how he would really think outside the box. So we, I spent a lot of time playing on the chess team under Ms. Mr. Lang's guidance, but also we would spend time inventing new board games that he had come up with and new, uh, you know, new, uh, most people would think about playing the games that they have, but the idea that you could invent new games and think about new logical problems, I think really uh, opened my mind. I also remember in Mr. Lang's class uh, developing at that time, we all had TI calculators, and so I wrote a program so that all of, all of my classmates, when I came to this new school, uh, we were learning how to solve quadratic equations, and a lot of people were finding that difficult, so I wrote a program with the TI calculator so you didn't really have to know 
how to solve quadratic equations. You just plug in the values and it would spit out the answer. And so I think that improved test scores that year. <laughs> I, uh, I apologize that the class of 97 might not be as good at quadratic equation solving as you might have liked. So, um, so all of what I've been showing you so far are the impacts of teachers on test score outcomes. But what I think that's actually not that interesting because if you think at the end of the day, we're educating kids not to do well on standardized tests, but rather to succeed as adults, right? As we hope today's graduates will. And so what I think is the more important result from this work that has um, meaning hopefully to all of you is that the same teachers who are raising test scores are having lasting impacts on children many, many years later. So this graph here shows you your earnings now instead of versus your own test score versus the quality of the teacher you had, say, in third grade or in fourth grade or in fifth grade. And it turns out that if you have teachers on the top end of this distribution that I was talking about, you're much more likely to have a higher, you're, you have a higher level of earnings than, than kids who just by chance ended up with lower quality teachers. So you see these lasting impacts of teachers on earnings, on the probability children go to college, even on other outcomes that you might not expect. So for instance, in this public school district, uh, significantly lower rates of, rates of teenage pregnancy if the child was assigned to a high quality teacher. Now what does this all add up to? One useful way to think about it, which is having an influence in the policy debate, is the following thought experiment. Suppose we take the bottom 5% of teachers as measured by their impact, say, on test scores, one concrete measure of, of teacher quality. Suppose we take those bottom 5% of teachers who, for whatever reason, unfortunately, are ineffective in the classroom, who are there, maybe not so much at USM, but at many other public schools in the US, and we replace those bottom 5% teachers with teachers of average quality, which is something we should be able to do if we hire new teachers, attract more people into teaching. What is the value of that exercise? Well, it turns out, based on our results, that generates an extra $50,000 of earnings per child over their lifetime, based on the estimates that I was just showing you. And if you translate that to a classroom of 28 students, which is the average class size in public schools in America, that, that's worth $1.4 million per classroom, right? So having a teacher of uh, average quality instead of being in the bottom 5%. Now, if you have excellent teachers, as I think many of the teachers at USM are on the far right of this distribution, you're gonna get even larger gains, right? So uh, at some level, you know, I think I kind of uh, had a sense that this was going on uh, even when I was in high school. So I, um, when I was preparing the speech, I managed to dig up, thanks to the wonders of modern technology, my own valedictorian speech, last saved in May 1997 in Word 2.0, uh, so, and here, here uh, let me read you something from that speech. So I said, as we leave the school for different colleges throughout America, we should take the time to appreciate the efforts of our teachers and to remember our own duty of shaping those who follow us. So, you know, it looks like I was onto maybe something as a 17 year old, uh, but you know, basically the way I think about it is now I have two and a half million data points to back me up on, uh, on that conjecture. So when this study uh, came out, one of the very nice things has been seeing how it's had an impact on American education. So here you see Nick Kristof uh, in the New York Times quoting, quoting this result, suppose that the bottom 5% of teachers could be replaced by teachers of average quality. That's more, point one, more than $1.4 million in gains for the average classroom. So when this study came out, I got a number of interesting reactions from uh, people around the country who, who emailed me, one of the most interesting, I thought, or the funniest, was um, from Ward Gorey, who was formerly the headmaster here at, at USM, as many of you will remember. Uh, and what he said in his email was, my favorite sender was one of our junior kindergarten teachers who forwarded me the article and asked me for a raise. <laughs> so good thinking. I'm, I hope I help all the teachers out here. Uh, the, the other thing that, you know, another message you get from this study, maybe for the parents, is an investment in an education like you've made at USM or like you're gonna pay for your, your kids' colleges has tremendous value. The, the return on investment here is incredibly high. I'm not saying this just to make you know, a pitch for the fundraising unit of USM here. It's uh, actually, I think, a legitimate fact from, um, uh, from the data. But the message that I wanna draw, which I think is relevant for today's graduates, is what I see here is that teachers have 
enormous social impact on a large scale in a way that it's very difficult for individual parents to, right? So parents can mold their own children, but if you think about the number of children that one teacher interacts with over the course of their career, every year if they're generating $1.4 million in value, you add that up over the course of a career, it's enormous, even just from an economic perspective, but think about it from a social perspective, where we have people who are living more fulfilling lives, we have less crime, we have so many other benefits for society. I think what's really interesting about this is this is a profession that, where you can really change the world in a big way. And so that brings me to the message that I want to con convey to the honored guests of the day, today's graduating seniors. So for the students, I want to say that you all have incredible prospects ahead of you, and the breadth of options you can pursue is truly dazzling, as I've seen in, in the past 15 years after graduating from this school. You'll end up studying an array of fields, you'll travel to many countries, you'll meet numerous new people, and importantly, I think you'll have an opportunity to change people's lives. Throughout that journey, I want to encourage you to keep in mind the value and importance of having a social impact, as I think many of your teachers have uh, here today. So to make this concrete to the students, let me outline some careers that I think many of you here are likely to pursue using data from our own students at Harvard. So let's look at what Harvard students did, which careers they chose in 1970. So uh, you can see, you know, you have academics, you have teaching, which already in 1970 was highly underrepresented among the most talented uh, students in America. Uh, and then you have finance and management, health, law, and writing or journalism. And you can see that there's a fairly even distribution across those categories except for teaching. So now come to 1990 where the study is repeated and you have more recent data and the surge is in finance and management. So now it turns out if you look today, and we don't have the data compiled, but preliminary estimates addressed, that, that green bar is over 50%. So most Harvard kids uh, go into finance or management. Now, you know, that's totally fine from an economist's perspective. I think th those fields have tremendous value. Uh, as all of you know from the recent financial crisis, finance is incredibly important for, for the economy. But the reason I show you these uh, charts is that, in my view, the two groups here, the, the, the students who are pursuing finance, management, careers in the private sector, and the various other students who are becoming doctors, researchers, even fewer are becoming teachers today, they have something to learn from each other, okay? Uh, and I think it's that the reason the private sector has been so successful and has grown so rapidly in attracting top talent is that people in the private sector have mastered the importance of scale and that's something that people who are interested in having a direct social impact would also benefit from. So let me tell you what I mean with an example. So this is an illustration from an anecdote uh, of an executive at Home Depot. So it turns out that one of these executives who was looking through Home Depot's vast data sets noticed that uh, an interesting pattern, which is whenever people came into st the store to buy paint, they also tended to buy these switch plate covers that uh, you know, go over the switches in your house. Now, if you think about it for a minute, you realize why that might happen. When you're trying to change the color of your walls, you might also want to change the color of these switch plates that go on the walls um, with these switches, right? So that seems like kind of a mundane observation to make, but that generated you know, tens of millions of dollars of profit for Home Depot because they figured out that they should put the switch plates right near the paint and they started selling way more switch plates than they did before. So the reason I think that example is interesting to me is that it doesn't sound like a phenomenally brilliant insight, but it's important because of its scale, because of the number of people who come uh, and shop at Home Depot. Each one of them now is more likely to buy uh, the switch plate at, at Home Depot. And correctly, I think that executive would be rewarded with payments in the millions of dollars because he's generated that much value to, for, for the company. But the critical thing is that if Home Depot was one store in some place, this would not be a tremendously valuable thing to figure out. It's because of the scale of the innovation. I think that same logic